So what I'm going to do is, uh, one second, hon. What I'm going to do is, um, for the month of December, we're going to just put aside the Bible study for now. Okay? We're just going to share the word and, and, and share some things uh, because I believe that God is doing, starting to do some great things. Amen? Okay, yes. Yes, we're going to have prayer. Bobby's going to open up on Monday. He's going to open up on Wednesday early, and he's going to open up on Sunday morning early. Okay? Oh, you come up too, honey. So we just want to pray for them, uh, you know, that God would uh, bless them, you know. Amen. So just stretch your forth, your hand toward them. Hallelujah. Father, as the leadership of this ministry, as we go on vacation, Father, we impart to them, Father, the mantle of authority. Father, that they will uh, have that mantle to uh, exercise your will and your purpose and your plan. Father, we're behind them 100%. And, Father, know that you'll use them Sunday morning, Father, for your glory, for your honor. So, Father, thank you for their, their love. Thank you for their dedication to you. Thank you, Father, for them being a part of this ministry, that we can trust them and entrust this ministry into their hands as we go on vacation. Lord, I thank you, God, that you're going to do great things through them, Father. Use them. Use, use our sister, uh, Violanta, Lord. If you give her a word to speak, let her not be ashamed. Give her a word, or Nelson a word, Lord, as he, as he comes and shares about, um, Father, the offering and, and whatever you have for them, Father. So as the pastor of this church and as Tom as the assistant pastor and, and my wife and Annie, Lord, we just lay hands on them and say thank you, Father, for the gifts that are going to flow through them on Sunday morning. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, hallelujah, amen, amen. Thank you. Can you just boost this just a little bit, Bobby, please? Yeah, boost it up a little bit. Um, Monday night, we came and we came and we were praying. And God dropped a, a word in my spirit. And it was, uh, um, I keep saying barricades, but it's not barricades. It's barriers. And just to pray against barriers. And we did Monday night. And I want to give one testimony, but I want anyone else who has a testimony, too, to come up and share it, because this is so important. We, we asked God to remove the barriers that are keeping people from the ministry. We asked God to remove the barriers in people's lives. We prayed for my cousin, uh, Joyce, in Boston. Uh, I shared with you Monday night that she was in a coma, that she has a brain uh, virus in her brain, and they don't understand what it is. And she wasn't talking. She wasn't eating anything. Tuesday morning, I get a text. And they said, we don't understand what happened. She's out of the coma. She's talking. She's eating. We're sending her back to New Bedford for rehab. Okay. And uh, uh, I was talking to someone else. And they were telling me that... Um, they're going to bring someone to church. They're, they're kind of fighting it a little bit. We're praying about the, the barriers. And her boyfriend's sister says, the next time you go to church, I want to go with you. So we prayed against the barriers that are keeping people away from the ministry. When God gives a rhema word, when he gives that word, there's, there's, there's life to it. And we're starting to see that. And we prayed for Rebecca because she's on third shift, and we were praying that that barrier be removed, that she will be on first shift. So why don't you come and share your testimony? She texts me early in the morning. She says, I hope it's not too early. That was Tuesday. You texted me, right? Yesterday morning. She texts me early in the morning. She says, I got first shift. I'm on first shift. <laughs> well, you could have, because I, I have it on vibrate, so it would have just, <laughs> you know, and I would have slept through that for sure. Uh, what was the other test? Oh, Linda, your testimony. Come on, come up here and give it. This is really cool. Hi, well, someone I work with had left 
my department and moved on. And um, she wanted to come back, but the higher authority said no, that, you know, she couldn't come back. And I, I said, well, I know when that higher authority speaks, like, that's the end of the road. But God just gave me faith to keep praying. I couldn't stop praying. And I prayed a particular way. And, um, well, <laughs> I don't really want to just because we're all over the place on Facebook. <laughs> Well, anyways, I pray, I pray, God, don't let them find anybody for that position and that they will have to hire her back. <laughs> and that's what happened. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. She prayed. Okay. Now, hear me now. That's, they didn't want to hire. They, the, the top one on the company said, no way. Ain't going to happen. I want to encourage you, when they say, no, it ain't going to happen, God answers prayer, okay? And Linda prayed that prayer specifically, and no, they, her, I think it was your boss that said, you know, they can't find anybody for that position. And so HR went to the CEO and said, you know what? We need to hire such and such a person back. And they did. So we're seeing some things happening. Amen? Anyone else? Anyone else got a testimony you want to share? Time to share it. Tina's back. Yes. Move the barriers, Lord. Move the barriers. And she's back. Darren's back. Amen. Remove the barriers. See, sometimes we look too much in the natural of things. And we look at the impossibility of the natural. But God knows and can move the natural to the supernatural. Amen. He can, inter, he can intervene in the natural. So I, I want to share with you tonight um, something from God's Word about these barriers. And when you come up against these barriers, and, and we're going to stop praying. And I want you to pray, okay? I want you to take that Word, and I want you to start to pray against the barriers in your life. And, and, and what, the barrier, what barriers are, barriers are, are put up to keep someone from or keep something from happening in other words, a barrier is put up so it, it will cause you to stop. And I said, God, we're going to remove the barriers in the spiritual realm. We're going to pray. We're going to believe. And, and I, I was just amazed. I said, God, we just prayed Monday. And look at Tuesday. Everything's happening. You know, because he gave that word, not me. And so let's take a hold of what God says. <clears throat> Excuse me. You gave some water for me, please, honey. Let's do what God said. And take the barriers out of the way and watch what God's going to do. Amen? Because, you know, every time I talk to different people, uh, and I was talking to one person, they were telling me, you know, when they were backslidden, the devil didn't bother them. They had no overpowering thoughts. They didn't have any, you know, any uh, attacks from the enemy. But they said, the moment I made a choice to come back to church, my mind has been bombarded. You know, God doesn't love you. God's not, you're not saved. You're going to go to hell. All of, all of these thoughts came into their minds. So that showed me something. And we, we knew it before, but, you know, sometimes we forget that the enemy is trying to keep people away from this ministry. Barriers. And so we need to stop praying against the barriers that the enemy has placed in people's lives of making a decision to come here. I hear people all the time, oh, I'm going to be coming, I'm going to be coming, and they don't come. I have family members that said, oh, they're going to come, and they don't come. Okay? We had people come for, uh, when Brother Diamond was here, okay? supposedly gave their hearts to Christ. Where are they? So let's pray against those barriers Excuse me, that um, are stopping people from coming. Your loved ones, medical People are sick. Stop praying against the barriers that are there that, for them to receive their healing. Amen. Whatever it may be. So let's do that and let's pray for that, okay? 
So keep that in your prayers in, for this ministry. You know, the barriers that, are, that the enemy has set up, that God will remove them by his holy angels, and we'll see the influx, and we'll see the dreams that people have had come to pass. Amen? Praise God. If you have your Bibles, open them up tonight to uh, Exodus chapter 14. So remember, Wednesday nights we're going to just finish out the rest of uh, December with preaching, some good preaching. Amen? And uh, then we'll start in January again on Wednesday. We'll start um, going back into the Bible study and finishing up on hermeneutics. We're going to start out with verse 9 in chapter 14. As soon as you get that up on the screen, we'll, we'll start there. Everybody there? Everybody there, 14.9? Well, why are you getting there? Father, we thank you and we praise you, God. I ask you, Lord, that you will, by your spirit, God, that you will move upon me and give me the anointing, Father, that only you can give, Lord, to bring your word forth that I believe you want spoken tonight. Father, I thank you for all that you're doing in our assembly, <clears throat> all that you're going to do in our assembly. And, Father, I, I just praise you and thank you for your wisdom, for your understanding, and for the an unction of the Holy Ghost that we all have in this ministry. I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to welcome those in Maine. God bless you, Linda, and God bless you, Sajiv, in India, and anyone else who's watching tonight. I thank God for your being a part of our service. In verse 9 of chapter 14, it says, But the Egyptians pursued after them. I want you to know, if you're a child of God, that the enemy is going to pursue you. Are you hearing me? If you are a true, born-again, spirit-filled Christian, the devil is going to pursue you. He doesn't play games. He doesn't play fair. Okay? And he'll use anything that he can to destroy you and to take you out. He's not merciful. He's not kind. He's not gentle. He will use every weapon against you and in your mind to cause you to doubt God and what God has planned for your life. The Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh. You can see right from this scripture that the enemy didn't hold anything back. He gave all. After, he, all the demons that he can assign to your life, he will assign them, and they will follow you throughout your day, and they will try to cause discouragement. They'll try to cause you to be down. They'll try to steal your joy. They'll try to steal your peace. All of these things that they try to do. But I, I want you to know something. That God says, remove the barriers. Remove the barriers. Any faithlessness, the barrier of faithless. If, you're, if you don't have faith, remove that barrier. And begin to speak the word. <clears throat> begin to speak the word. Begin to speak the word. Let the word come out of your mouth. Amen? Hallelujah. <clears throat> Excuse me. It says, All the chariots and all the horsemen in his army and overtook them encamping by the sea beside Pihiroth before Belzephon. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes. And I want you to understand something. When you're going through something, the thing that you're going through is real. The battle that you're facing is real. There's no two ways about it. Whatever you're going through in the feelings and your emotions, they're real because you're, you're, you're coming up against an enemy. Okay. And when that happens, it's very easy to get your eyes on the things that are happening to you and getting your eyes off of God. The Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of, of your faith. Hallelujah. He's the author and the finisher. So you know that there's going to be a beginning and you got saved and there's going to be an end. And that's when we're going to be with him. Amen. 
So he is the author and the finisher of everything. So when the enemy comes in like a flood, God will raise up that standard against him. <clears throat> when the enemy comes in like a flood, and he's trying to get my voice tonight, and he ain't going to do it in the name of Jesus. When you lift up your eyes, look, lift up your eyes to the hills from which comes your help. Don't lift up your eyes on the circumstances, on the situation, and on the problem that you're facing. Can I tell you something, and I hope this... This penetrates your spirit. Do you really understand that you're a child of the living God? Do you understand that? That you're God's kid. You belong to him. He's your father. Hallelujah. And knowing that he's your father, not just in a theological realm, but in an experiential realm, and knowing that he's your father, and no good thing will he withhold to them that love him. Amen? So when you go through the tough time, when you go through the battle, when you go through and you lift up your eyes and you see the enemy all around you, and it's, he's compassed around you in whatever circumstance or situation you're going through. And one thing I liked that Alicia said, he said, he ruined my day. Well, he didn't ruin the whole day. Okay? Okay? And that's good because somewhere down in, somewhere during the day, she realized that, hey, no, you're not going to ruin my whole day. I may have a little setback, okay? But you're not going to ruin my whole day, okay? And so here it says, they, he, he, they lifted up their eyes and they beheld the Egyptians marching after them and they were afraid. Now let me say this. Sometimes you're in a circumstance or you're not, you or I are in a circumstance or situation in life, okay? And it's scary. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know. You know that if God doesn't come through, some you know we're in trouble. And sometimes we allow fear to come in. How many know that when fear comes in, there's a two 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 response to fear. It's fight or flight. When fear comes in, you either run, or you stand your ground and you fight. Right? The Bible says we're not of those who shrink back. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So when we face the battles of life, and I don't care what battles they, they may be, I don't care what you're facing, when we, when we come against those battles, you need to look to the hills from which comes your help. Because your help is not coming in the natural. It's coming in the supernatural, into the natural. Hallelujah. God can change hearts. I said this today to somebody. I said, the heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord. So don't look at the king as the final authority. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The king is not the final authority. God is the final authority. And when he wants something done, and he wants his will to be done in a circumstance and situation in your life, it will happen. It will come to pass because he's God. Hallelujah. Amen? Hallelujah. It says, and they were so afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. <clears throat> Let me tell you this. There's a right way to cry out to God, and there's a wrong way. Okay. When you cry out to God during your circumstance and situation, if you're crying out complaining, moaning, and groaning, why me, God? How come, how come this happened to me, God? How? God said, well, let's, let's examine this. Let's look at it. Are you my servant? Do you obey my, 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 my ways and my laws? Yes, Lord. Okay, I do. Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, am, am I your Savior and Lord and Master? Yeah. But then, then you don't have any rights. Well, I got a very weak amen. I hope I got a better one on Facebook. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Give me an amen. Right. Okay, because you're saying true. it's the truth, so now you're accountable. Amen? You've got to look to God for your strength. You've got to look for God to be your help. You've got to look to God that will intervene in the situation. <clears throat> Just to kind of digress for a moment from what I'm sharing with you tonight. Uh, I was here this morning because they 
they, t- they took my keyboard because I'm getting another keyboard, so they're bringing it to New Jersey to sell it for me. And so with that money I get from that, I'll be able to put a little bit more and get a, a one with a larger keyboard, uh, 70, 71 keys. And uh, it's going to be really great. It'll be nice. So anyway, so I was here this morning at quarter past eight. <clears throat> so I left here. <clears throat> I'm driving down the road here, and, I, and they, you know that building they're putting up here? It's going to be a dollar store. That's what it's going to be. Okay. And I felt the Lord say, just go over there and stop there and go talk to the guy and look inside. So I stopped, and I went in, and I looked inside. I said, man, this is a nice building. It's about 17,000 square feet. I said, man, it's beautiful. You know, and they're putting up the sheetrock, and they're all working. And I asked who the... Uh, general contractor was, and I had my constable outfit on, so they thought I, w- I thought somebody was going to get arrested. And uh, so uh, they showed me the guy, and I went over, and I called him over, and I says, uh, can I talk with you? He says, yeah. So we started talking. Come to find out he was a 10-year veteran policeman in Los Angeles, and he was a sheriff, and, and now he's doing construction work. And he lives in Rhode Island, Chapachet, as a matter of fact. And he, what a nice guy. So he took me, he says, come on, I'll, I'll take you inside and I'll show you around. So he showed me everything around and he explained to me different things and he showed me the blueprints and all that stuff. And, you know, I said, he said, well, wh- why do you want to know what's going on here? I said, well, because we're, we're, we're in the planning stage. He said, planning for what? I said, well, we're in that building over there. I said, you see the white shades? He said, yes, yeah. that's our church. And I said, and we want to we wanna plan on building a church on this land. So I said, just give me an idea. What does a building like that cost? It's a metal building. He said, well, when it's finally all completed, he said, the building will be about 500000 It's like, wow. And it's, bu- and it's a nice building. If you look at it, it almost looks like a church. Okay? And uh, I said, well, I want a building that looks like a church, but if it needs to be sold, if we were to go bigger or, or build somewhere else, that we could sell it easily because it's an industrial area. So he says, that's a very smart thing. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> and, so, uh, and so we just got talking, and we became friends. And he's an he's a expert um, a marksman. He, he competes in competition with pistols, and we were talking about guns, and we were talking about holsters and all kinds of stuff. And he gave me his card. He said, call me. So we developed a little friendship. He says, come by in two weeks when it's done. I'll take you inside so you can see everything. And so uh, <coughs> I don't know what God's doing, but the dreams that people have had said this place is going to be filled. And if this place is filled, then we'll be able to do something over there. Amen? So let's get back to the story. So children of Israel begin to cry out to the Lord, and the next verse says this. They begin to complain. And they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness. Whoa. Man, they just saw the miracles of the, of the, of the way God intervened for them with the frogs and the lice and the darkness and all of that stuff. He, they saw the victory with the Passover and all of that stuff, how God was powerful and mir- the miracles happened. They saw all of those things. It wasn't a long period of time before now they run into a situation. And isn't that like Christians? You know, things are going well for Christians. You know, they're doing good, and all of a sudden something happens. But don't be like them. Don't be like them. Don't develop habits. Don't let the enemy speak to you in, in your carnality and allow your carnality to take over and stop moaning and groaning and complaining. You know why? Because if you begin and I begin to complain, God's going to leave us in that thing until we learn the lesson. If we're complaining all the time, like the Bible says, they wandered in the wilderness for, was it 40 years? 40 is the number of probation. So they were put on probation for 40 years because all they kept doing was moaning and complaining, moaning and complaining. You need to thank God and, 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 and bless God for the things that he is doing. Amen? And even in the midst of trials and even in the midst of disappointment, to be able to praise God and say, God, I can't figure this thing out. I don't know what's going on, but you do. And 
You're my Lord and Master. You're my Father. I'm going to trust you. I choose to trust you. And Lord, I know you've never let me down. You've never failed me, and you never will. Regardless of the outcome. But no, that's not what they did here. What they did here, they said, because there were no graves in Egypt, in other words, there wasn't enough room to bury us all, you brought us out here to take us away and die in the wilderness. What happened to all the miracles? What happened to their faith in their God? They allowed the circumstances and situations that they found themselves in to dictate to them their outcome. That's right. That's right. I, I quoted this. I don't know if I quoted it here, but when I was in Nigeria, I says, life is like a bunch of chapters. Just don't get stuck in the chapter you're in now. What you're in now, the chapter of your life that you're in now doesn't mean that's going to be your life. It's just a chapter. You're going to go on to a new chapter. God's going to turn the page. It's just going to be something different. Okay? But you know what? There are some slow readers. It just takes a little longer to turn the page. There are some slow learners. It takes a little longer to turn the page. God's not going to turn the page on you and I until we learn the lesson that he wants us to learn. And that means he loves us. Because he wants to teach us through the trials, through the tribulations, through the things that we go through in life, through the disappointments, through all of those things, even our mistakes that we make. All things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. He's going to work it out. Even when we make mistakes, don't think for a moment God was fooled. He didn't know about it. He knew, he knew about the mistakes you were going to make and I was going to make. He knows all about that. But even in that, even in that if, as we trust him, he will turn that thing around as we start to say, God, you know what? I messed up. Now, Lord, bring me back to the right path I need to be on. And he does it. Right around he comes. Wherefore hast thou dealt with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? In other words, that's the reason why you took us out of Egypt. Now, see, let me say this to you. When things start going wrong, don't blame the pastor. Everybody wants to blame the pastor. Everybody wants to blame the church. Don't blame the church. Don't blame the pastor. Okay. Blame your complaining and your murmuring about what you ha is happening in your life. Woe is me. The devil will say, yep, woe is you. You're a poor thing. Okay. And then you have a a pity party. You know, we used to sing a song in the world. Every party needs a pooper. That's why we invited you. Party pooper. Man, God don't want no party poopers. You know, I mean, no. Yes, what we go through is real. Yes, what the trials are, are hard. Yes, all of those things. But you know what? We've got God. And greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. You know, do we really believe that, though? Do you really believe that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world? Then if you believe that, then guess what? Why don't you live that way? Why don't you act that way? Why doesn't your face show it? Your face should show it. You're a child. Listen, you're a child of the living God. You know, I see Vicky with her granddaughter and how much she loves that child and how much she would protect that child and how she, she wants to pamper that child and, and take care of that child and make sure that child is safe and warm and clean and, you know, fed and all of those things. How much more your Heavenly Father? Yes, yeah, sometimes we need a pamper change, and spiritually speaking, and God will change our pampers for us. You know, he'll clean us up when we get dirty. But that doesn't mean he doesn't love us. It doesn't mean that he doesn't care about us. So here the, here the children of Israel, here they are, right? They're all, all messed up now in their thinking. I mean, I mean, we haven't seen the miracles that they saw. Think about it. And here they are moaning, complaining, oh, it was better for us to stay in Egypt, and now we're going to die out here in 
in the desert, and we're, you know, poor me, poor m- my problems. You know, we should have stayed there. Look at my feet, you know, they're all swollen from the heat. And come on. Next verse, please. Is not this the word that we did tell you in Egypt? Listen, they were in bondage for 400 and something years. They were in the midst of a people that worshipped idols. They're talking about the people of God that had a relationship with God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, you know, with the story of Joseph and God's deliverance and how he cared for And they're saying, didn't we tell you in Egypt to leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? Can I tell you something? Carnal Christians would rather serve their carnality than serve God. They'd rather listen and bow down their hearts and their minds to their flesh than obey God. It's the truth. People don't like to hear that truth, but it's true. We have a tendency to want our flesh to, to uh, dictate to us everything in life. Didn't we tell you to leave us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? Are you crazy? Think about why would a Christian who once experienced Jesus Christ want to go back to the drugs and the alcohol and the the illicit sexual relationships and, and all of the things, the hurt, the pain, the, all of that stuff before you were a Christian, go back into all that stuff. Why would you want to do that? Think about that. Think about where you were before you were a Christian. Think about what you were doing before you were a Christian and the desires that you had before you were a Christian. Why would you want to be in bondage when he has set you free? And that was the mentality of these Egyptian, of, of these uh, Israelites. They said that we may serve the Egyptians. For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. Now they're comparing bondage, okay, to comfort. We'd rather be, we'd rather be in bondage than be out here in this desert. There's no, we're in a place right here, okay. We're in a place surrounded. Okay, by mountains and by water. We can't go to the left. We can't go to the right. We can't go forward because of the water. And here's the army of Israel pursuing us. They're going to kill us. They're going to annihilate us. It would have been better if we just stayed in Egypt and served them. But now we're going to die in the wilderness. You want to talk about abandoning God? Not having faith to believe in God. Verse 13. Thank God for the voice of God through men of God. Are you hearing me? I'm reading a book called The Paradigm by Jonathan Kahn. I put it on Facebook people to look at. I'm going to bring it with me on my trip so I can finish reading it. No, I'm not going to tell you the whole, I'm not going to tell you anything about the book. All I'm going to say is this, is that he compares our time with the time of Ahab and Jezebel. And when I read that, and I said, I said, man, this is going to be interesting. But then, I believe it was God dropped a little nugget into my spirit. Don't you love it when he does that? He said, whenever there was a time where there was an Ahab and a Jezebel, there was always an Elijah. Whenever that was happening in society with the government, there was always an Elijah, a man of God that would speak God's word 
I believe that in our time, and I'm praying, that God, let us be a voice. Let for his glory, Christian assembly, be a voice against the powers of the enemy, against the, uh, the enemy that has crept into the church. And I, I said this on Facebook to someone. I said, we were, they were kind of corresponding back and forth. And I said, the thing we need to do is we need to watch out for the sheep, the wolves in sheep's clothing. There are people in the church that are wearing sheep's clothing. They look like sheep. They smell like sheep. There's a sheep's clothing. If you took a sheepskin and put it on you, there's a smell still there. So they smell like sheep. They look like sheep. They talk like sheep. But inside, they're ravenous wolves. And we're seeing that in the church today. There are even witches that are pretending to be Christians that are sitting in churches and cursing the pastor and cursing, cur cursing the children of, of God in that church. And those who are living uh, not right with God, those who are not right with God and things that are falling under God's judgment, those things can affect them. You say, well, I don't believe that, man. I don't believe that because once you're God's child, I'm always God's child. But let me tell you this. My Bible tells me, and if you read your Bible, it'll tell you that the wrath of God abides on the children of disobedience. And he's talking to believers. I believe it's in Ephesians or Galatians. Right? Isn't he talking to Christians? Talking to the Christian church, ain't he? He says, the wrath of God is on the children of disobedience. So, here, Moses says to them, and thank God for a prophet. Thank God for a man like Dave Wilkerson, Leonard Ravenhill, some of these, uh, uh, Reverend Clarendon, all these guys that came up and, and really spoke the word of God and uh, speaking the word of God today, like Ron Sutton, and others that are up there preaching the gospel and taking a stand and getting a lot of flack for it, okay? Getting a lot of judgment by the church people of saying he's not loving and kind. I say, you know what? You don't know Ron. Ron's got the sweetest, kindest heart. When I sat with him and talked with him, I mean, the man left his family and went to Nicaragua for two years as a missionary, Okay. I mean, in, in, in adverse conditions when they were having the big wars in, 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 in Nicaragua and all that, he still went and he preached. Okay, he, he's been all over the world. and You can't even get out of your chair. You know, these people can't even get out of their chair and serve God, and they're the ones that complain in the morning, going, you've got to be kind and loving and all this other stuff. Well, it is kind and it is loving to tell people the truth and love. Amen? As long as you go with the right attitude. But you know what? There's a lot of Pharisees. There's a lot of Sadducees in the church today. That, you know, that are sitting there in churches and there are people that are in church that are not saved. They're not saved. A.W. Towser said it this way. He said, I fear that there's a generation rising where they claim to be Christians without transformation. That's true. You have a lot of people that have the title, but they don't have the relationship. So anyway, Moses says to the people, what does he say to them? Fear not. Okay. Now, why would Moses tell them not to fear? Anybody have an answer? Spit it out. Why would Moses tell them not to fear? Because they had fear. Right? Why would I tell somebody to not have fear if they don't have fear? Doesn't make sense. They were fearful. In fact, we read it a little while ago. They were afraid. But the man of God comes and says, don't be afraid. Why did he say that? Because of the two factors of fear, either fight or flight. Okay. He was telling them, don't fear. Don't fight. Don't flight. Who said it? Watch. Stand still. Some of the battles that you fight, okay, you're not going to have to lift a finger. Oh, it's easy to fight. 
And God says, no, don't fight. Just stand still. Okay. Once again, I'm going to prove to you who God is. Okay. I'm going to prove to you so that you can't boast. You can't get up there and be all proud and arrogant, thinking that your strength is what won this battle. Okay. And can I tell you, God is going to put you in your Christian life in positions where you can't go left, you can't go right, you can't go backwards, and you can't go forwards. And it's for a reason because he's trying to teach you to depend upon him. But before you'd either run or you'd act out in the flesh, walk away from God. He said, stand still. Don't flight. Don't fight. Stand still and see, see the salvation of the Lord. See how God is going to save you in the circumstances that you're in. In the place that is so confining that you can't move. Stand still and watch what God's going to do. which he will show you today. Hallelujah. In other words, it's not going to be tomorrow. It's not going to be next week. He's going to show you today. Hallelujah. He's going to show you today. He's going to show you himself strong. See, God is a God of today. Hallelujah. That, that shows that he's living today. And then he says this. This is so cool. He says, man, you see these Egyptians who you see today? You will see them again no more forever. Now, that doesn't mean that the devil won't come back anytime soon. But what that does mean is that particular situation or circumstance where the enemy has had the upper hand seemingly? He's not going to have the upper hand anymore. God's going to annihilate him. The barriers are being removed. And I, I, and I tell, I told, when I preached Sunday morning, I said, there's four things of making the word of God effective. Who remembers them? What's the first one? Listen. Did you get it? Listen. Believe. Speak. And do. See, here, they listened. Right? When did they believe? When they saw. When they saw that water pot. Think about that. God did that for them. Twofold purpose. God did it for them and to destroy the enemy. And if we were using symbolism here, we could say, you know, water in, in a symbol, symbolic fashion, water is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And today we have the Holy Spirit who defeats the enemy. He implements everything that Jesus did, everything Jesus said. He implements the cross in our life and in our hearts. He's a person, isn't he? The Holy Spirit's a person. Does he live inside of you? All right, come on now. Think about this. The third person of the Trinity lives inside of you. He said he shall be in you and he shall be with you, meaning he's omnipresent. Not only is he in you, but he's upon you and he's with you. That's why if God be for us, who can be against us? So no matter what you face, no matter what you go through, whether it be work or so-called friends or situations or circumstances in life, whatever it may be, 
matter what you go through, maybe sickness, maybe some pain, maybe some, some setbacks, whatever it is. He says, you know what? You're not going to see them again. You're not going to see this enemy again. I'm going to defeat them. And so what does Moses do? He puts up the rod. And the water separate. Can you imagine the expression on the people's face? You know, when I was hearing these testimonies come in, I had a smile on my face. I was like, this is so cool. This is neat. You know, and then Linda gets a text that, you know, we call her the Bahama girl. Tina was coming back, that things worked out. I was like, yes. I was excited. And then when uh, Linda shared that, I was excited. And then when Rebecca shared that, I was excited. When I got that text about my cousin, that was exciting. Hallelujah. Because you know what? That means that there's more barriers to come down and be pushed back. And I really believe Kathleen is next. That barrier is being moved. The barrier is being moved. Hear me what I'm saying now. The barrier is being pushed back. It's being moved. The Holy Ghost is moving that barrier. Oh, yeah, don't go by what you see. Don't go by what you hear. Because what you see and what you hear is only temporary. God is going to have his way. Amen? And with that way, and all of your family members, we're going to believe God for that. We're going to move the barriers in your life. What are the things that you have hindering in your life? What some of the things that you're still battling with? Can I tell you the reason why you're battling with them is because you're battling. You need to stand still and let God do it. You gotta let God overcome that thing. He already did overcome it in the cross. Hallelujah. Everything is through the cross. All of your success is in the cross. All of your victory is in the cross. Because that's where the power of God is. He says to the, to the Jew, the preaching of the cross is a stumbling block. Uh, to, the, to the Jew, it's, uh, to, the Jew it's, to the Greek is a stumbling block. To the, no, to the Jew, yeah, to the Jew is a stumbling block. To the Greek, it's foolishness. But he says, but to us which are saved, it is the power of God. Not the wood, not the wood, but what took place on that cross. What took place on that cross was your old man, my old man, was crucified with him. That sinful nature was crucified with him, put to death. Still living there, though, by the way. Okay? In the same way that Christ was raised from the dead, you can raise your old nature back again if you want to. That's how he says, walk in the spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You walk in the spirit through crucifixion, realizing that that old person is dead. Hallelujah. The way you used to behave, the things you used to do, you don't do them anymore. Why? Not because you turned over a new leaf, but because the cross of Jesus Christ was effective in your life. So the victory comes by standing still and accepting what Christ has done for you and then having faith, hearing it, believing it, speaking it, so the enemy, let me say this. this. How many know the devil's not a mind reader? The devil can't read your mind. He's not omniscient. He cannot read your mind. So if you're like this, you don't hear that. But you begin to say, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over you. And the barriers you've set up against my child from coming to church, from getting saved, I pray in the name of Jesus those barriers be removed by his holy angels, begin to do that. I'm telling you, I just sense that is a word of the Lord for this church, is to remove the barriers. Ask God to remove the barriers in your life and take authority that God has given you. Hallelujah. See, the problem is people hear it, but they don't believe it. They hear it, they hear it, they hear it. Jesus said, behold, 
I have given you authority. Behold, I have given you. In other words, take notice of what I'm saying. That's what that word behold means. Take notice of what's being said. I'm telling you, I have given you, not I will give you, I have given you power over scorpions and serpents and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing by any means shall hurt you. Now, we hear that, but do we believe that? The devil doesn't care if you hear it. The devil only cares if you believe it. And when you believe it, you'll speak it. So when the enemy comes in, you speak the word. You hear rebellion come into your home? You stand up? Get in front of your husband or wife or whoever's being rebellious, get in front of them, and you speak it out. Satan, you are the king of rebellion. You're the first one to ever rebel. And so I take authority over that rebellion. You are not coming in my house. You are not welcome in my house. I bind you in the name of Jesus, and I send you where Jesus would send you. Right now, spirit of rebellion, you go in Jesus' name. Amen. You need to speak it out. You need to hear it. You need to believe it. You need to speak it out. And then you need to do it. How many saw War Room? The movie War Room. Right? Remember the, remember the, the, the wife, the young wife, when she finally got, got the truth of that? She went out and she opened her door. She said, devil, you get out of my house. In the name of Jesus, you're not welcome here. You're not going to steal my husband. In the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody. That's the way we need to do things. That's what we have to do. We have to be vigilant because the enemy's vigilant, and he's, seeking, he's walking throughout the whole earth seeking whom he may devour. That's his job, to devour your, your whole life. And if you sit there, woe is me, oh, God, you know, what am I going to do now? No. Hey, together, God, you know what we're going to do? We're going to stand in faith. We're going to believe your word. We're going we're to hear your word. We're going to speak your word. We're going to believe your word. We're going to speak your word. We're going to believe your word. We're going to speak your word, and we're going to do your word. And you'll have the victory. Hallelujah. You won't see them anymore. They're going to be gone. That thing's going to be gone. Then you're going to wonder why you worried and why you fretted and why you sweated and all kinds of things. I told a person the other day, I don't know if they believe me or not, but I told them, <clears throat> I said, um, I don't get discouraged. I mean, I don't get, I don't get um, depressed. And they kind of looked at me, I don't get depressed. I said, I get discouraged, but I don't get depressed. I don't let myself get that far down where I start saying, okay, God, I'm discouraged. I need to get encouragement. And so I'll read the word, I'll sing a song, or I'll think of David Diamond, and I'll start laughing. If, ever you want, if you're discouraged and you want to get a good laugh, just start thinking about David Diamond and some of the things he says and some of the things he does. And I just start laughing, and he gets, I said, Lord, thank you. I can think of these things, and he, you know, all the stories that he told about how he smacked this one and kicked that one and, you know, did all kinds of stuff, and, you know, uh, and he got healed, and, you know, the stories he tells about church and all that stuff, and I just, you know, you know, that's what we need to do. We need to go back and say, you know what, Lord, nothing in this life is worth taking my love away from you. Nothing in this life is worth me not fighting for what I believe in. And I think that's what the church has done. We've kind of sat back and let everything into the church. Now the church is a mess. Okay? The church has become more worldly, trying to win the world. And guess what? They've won the world. That's exactly what they are, the world. They're not, they're not of the spirit. They're in the world. they got a bunch of worldly Christians in there. Okay? But when the rubber hits the road, it's going to cost them something to serve Christ. They'll run like rabbits. But they that endure to the end 
shall be saved. Why did he say that? Enduring. Because things are going to get tough. Amen? So let's not fear. Don't let fear grip your soul. Be a fighter. Amen? And begin to pray for the barriers that are hindering your blessing be removed in Jesus' name. Amen? God bless you today.